Okay, we're starting. Let's try to go over, maybe we'll go over the quiz a little bit. It's a good review, I guess. So, so it's quiz six. One was just some fill in the blanks. So it's just, at, at this point, it's like knowledge that I expect you to know. Um, so it says you know that the reduced row echelon form, so you're given the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is the n by n identity. What does that tell you about Ax equals b has, what does that tell you about the solutions? Has one solution, or you can put a unique solution. What does that tell you about whether A is singular or non-singular? Non-singular. What does that tell you about the determinant of A? It's not equal to zero. What does that tell you about uh, if AX equals zero, then that means your X is equal to the zero vector. Um, it, what does it tell you about A inverse? Exists or not exist? It has to exist. Um, so it says A is or is not a product of, what were the blanks here? Is a product of elementary matrices. Uh, there's also one that it says if AX equals B, like in general, then you can say X is equal to A inverse times B. That was problem one. Problem two. Suppose A and B are invertible, then a, B inverse is equal to? B inverse, A inverse. You know each individual are invertible, so you can invert them and multiply in the opposite order. 3. A is a 3 by 3. I know that the determinant of A is minus 2. What is the determinant of 3A squared A transpose A inverse? How'd you get that? Uh, three cubed. So it's three cubed. Because you multiply a matrix by a constant, the determinant is scaled by that constant for every single row. So there were three rows, so it multiplies by three, three times. You get three cubed. What about a squared? It's negative two squared. It's negative two squared. So the determinant is raised by the same power as the matrix is raised by that power. A transpose. It's just the same. The determinant of A transpose is the determinant of A. And basically here we're using the rules that this is just the determinant of 3A squared times the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A inverse. What's the determinant of A inverse? It's 1 over the determinant of A, so that gives you negative 1 half. So this cancels that, the negative cancels the negative, and so you end up with... Uh, 3 cubed times 4, which you said that's 1 away. Uh, professor? Yeah. So the exponent of like 3 to the third power is depending on the size of the matrix. Yeah, it depends on the size of the matrix. If it was a 4 by 4, you would raise it to the fourth. 5 by 5, you raise it to the 5. You raise it to the power of the number of rows. 3 by 4. Then it's impossible. Determinants are only defined for square matrices. Um, the bonus, I asked you to find an inverse. That's what I'm going to talk about today, so we won't have to do that. So today's going to be a short lecture. I'm basically going to tell you about two ways to find an inverse. We're going to compute the inverse, and we're going to use it, and then we go home. But that being said, because after that, I really want to kind of switch gears, and we're going to go back in sort of this facts definition mode, which I, I'm not going to be in the mood to do. Um, so I, I have half a mind to just give you guys a printout with all these facts and I'll talk about it in class rather than us 
all copying them down. Um, so I'll probably do that next time. But I'll finish the material for the first test on Thursday, pretty much. So after we talk about inverses today, on Thursday what we're going to go over is just algebraic facts of matrices. So I'm going to tell you about the rules of algebra for matrices. Things like, oh, addition is commutative, but multiplication is not, or this and that. You know, just like things you can use to simplify matrix expressions and how matrices kind of function in the algebraic sense. We'll talk about that on Thursday. But given that, once I finish that, we'll finish all the material for the first test. And so I will set test one to be so I told you guys I'll, I'll know more specifically later on. March 27th. Spring break starts the 29th, right? So it's the, that's, that's a Tuesday before spring break. So that's when test one is going to be. I don't remember if I already posted a review, but if not, I'll, I'll post a review before that. By Thursday, I'll post a review to things you might want to look out for and pay attention to. Um, it will be a mixture of computations and proofs, so you are going to need to know how to prove things. Similar to the suggested problems, in this class in particular, it's, it's good for you to go over the suggested problems because the online homework can't really grade proofs. So when I give you online homework, it's mostly the computational side. But if you want to practice on the proof problems, you should be like trying the suggested problems. Yeah? Uh, would the proof like, be based on like concepts or, like um, for example, the equivalence theorem, like kind of to that? Or would it be more like... Um, it could be to prove a part of the equivalence theorem. Like I can say, so the equivalence theorem so far has a list of like five things in it. So I could give you, assume this one thing, prove this other thing uh, at the level of difficulty of the equivalence theorem. I could also ask you to use the equivalence theorem to prove something else. I could ask you to prove something like, prove that a type 3 operation does not affect the determinant. And I could also, I'll also ask you to prove a bunch of things that the lecture on Thursday is going to help you with. Um, so I can, by the end of today, I want to define something called a symmetric matrix, for example. And I can say something like, prove that if a matrix is symmetric, then its transpose is also symmetric, or a product of two symmetric things are symmetric, and so on and so forth. Um, so you'll use a lot of facts, basically. Um, no proof will be terribly long, but you should pretty, be pretty comfortable with proving in general, and all sorts of proving techniques. But any individual proof will be like, in terms of length and difficulty, it will kind of be like one part of the equivalence theorem. So you need to know how to prove that. Or quizzes that, or proofs that I've put on quizzes before. Um, so it should be pretty short. But you, you will need to know how to stitch certain ideas together in a logical way. Um, so today we're going to continue with inverses. So last time we laid the groundwork a lot of groundwork for inverses, so now I'm going to tell you two specific methods to find an inverse. We're going to use these two methods to find some inverses, and we're going to use the inverse to solve an equation, and then we go ahead. So recall, if A is invertible, then A is equal to the product of a number of elementary matrices, where the E, I, R elementary matrices. All right, that we know from the equivalence theorem. If A is invertible, I can write it as a product of a bunch of elementary matrices. Remember, an elementary matrix is just a matrix that you obtain by performing one operation on an identity matrix. Okay? So basically what that means, something we can take away from that, This means I can start with A also. Oh, this is another part. Like, I don't, I'm not going to prove it again. Um, but it's another fact that we know. Um, the reduced row echelon form of A is, is the identity matrix. We 
that means that there are a set of row operations that I can perform on this guy, d1, d2, all the way up to dk, so that the result will be the identity. Remember, we can describe row operations in terms of elementary matrices. And so what that would give us is that this product here works as a inverse. In other words, we can think of a inverse as a product of elementary matrices. But that's almost laughably obvious. That's, that's a problem of elementary matrices times an identity. And so how you can interpret this expression is it's a bunch of row operations on the identity. I'm not sure if that's going to show up in the camera. That's kind of like OK. So in other words, this kind of leads to the fact that I can write an, I, an inverse of a matrix as a bunch of row operations performed on the identity. In fact, these are exactly the same row operations used to turn A into the identity. The same guys that I, put, I up, up, apply to A in order to get the identity are exactly the same guys I can apply to the identity to get A inverse. This gives us one method to find an A inverse. I'm going to do a bunch of row operations on an identity matrix. Professor? Yeah? They don't have to be in reverse order? They just have to like, Oh, the same, I, the I'm not They have to be in the same order. Same order. Yeah. The order will matter. <clears throat> Well, actually, technically, order doesn't matter, but to be efficient, you'll do things in the same order. Right, remember, the, the, um, to get to the reducer or echelon form of a matrix, it, it is a unique reducer or echelon form. So it doesn't actually matter what row operations you take or how you apply them. You'll get to the same place ultimately. But it'll be more efficient to do them um, together. This leads to? Method one for finding an inverse. <coughs> You're going, you can use row operations to find an inverse. Which row operations? The row operations used to turn A into the identity matrix. So what we do, step one, augment the matrix with the identity. what you're going to do is you're going to find the reducer or echelon form of A. So you're going to apply a bunch of row operations to find the reducer or echelon form. Right. Now, if A is invertible, what is its reducer or echelon form? It's going to end up being the identity. But I know applying those same row operations on the identity will result in inverse. the inverse. So to find an inverse matrix, this is one thing you can do. So that's step three. A inverse will appear on the right side. when I n appears on the left. So you just copy it down. The exact same operations I use to turn A into the identity are the exact same operations used to turn the identity into A inverse. So that's method one for finding an inverse. 
using the elementary matrices concept, I can figure out how to do it with by <coughs> row operations. Example. Find a inverse if we're gonna do two examples, we're gonna do a two by two and a three by three. Okay, so two by two is easy. We'll do one, two, three, four. There's a formula for this, but I'll actually derive that formula later on. So let's say we want to use this method to compute A inverse for the two by two, one, two, three, four. So here's what we would do. One, I'm going to augment one, two, three, four augment that with the 2 by 2 identity. 2, I'm going to find the reducer echelon form of this. So quickly, how can we get to that? We'll establish the pivot here. That's already a 1, so I'd probably leave that first. Immediately, I want to kill this 3. So what can I do? So row one, so you, you want to take row two minus three row one. It sounds like what you guys are doing. Okay, so this minus three times that is zero. This minus three times that is minus two. This minus three times that is minus three. This minus three times that is one, right? Right, now what? I'm ultimately going to want to pivot here, so I'm going to want to kill this two. How can I do that? Yeah. Well, I can just add them. Add row one and row two. That'll be one, zero, minus two, one, zero, minus two, minus three, one. Now what? Divide the second row by minus two. So this is row 2 divided by minus 2, or you can think of it as multiplying by a half if you want to be strict about it. So it'll be 0, 1, 3 over 2, 1 over 2. Um, minus here, right? And that should be your A inverse. check to make sure we got the right thing. We know that A times A inverse should give us the identity in this case. So this guy, that means if I take 1, 2, 3, 4 and multiply it by minus 2, 1, 3 over 2, minus a half, then that would give me minus 2 plus 3. Here this would give me 1 minus 1. Here I would get minus 6 plus 6. Here I would get 3 minus 2. So that's the right answer. There's a formula for the two by twos, and I'll, I'll, I'll derive that for you a bit later. But you can realize that this is one over the determinant times something we call the adjoint matrix. But this is one method. Two by twos are, are sort of trivial, but I just wanted to quickly give you an example here. Let's do it for something that's slightly bigger, like a 3 by 3. And something like this you can also expect on the test, like compute the inverse for this 3 by 3 
uh, matrix and then use it to do something. So 1 minus 2, 3, 2 minus 1, minus 1, minus 3, 1, 4. So again, we'll do sort of the same idea, 1 minus 2, 3, 2 minus 1, minus 1, minus 3, 1, 4. We'll augment that with the 3 by 3 identity. And now we're going to do raw operations. That's already a pivot, so I'm going to leave the first row. Now I'm going to want to kill everyone below that. So what can I do in this one? Like 2 row 1 minus row 2 or something similar to that. And so 2 times this minus that, 0. 2 times this is minus 4 plus 1. 2 times this is 6 plus 1. 2 times this is 2 plus 0. 2 times this is 0 plus 1. 2 times this is 0 plus 0. And then here I can do 3 row 1 plus row 3. 3 times this is 3 plus that is 0. That's minus 6 plus 1. Uh, 9 plus 4. 3 plus 0. 0 plus 0. 0 plus 1. That. What's another step here? You add row one and row two, and then um, add that to row three. Add row one and row two. Uh, so this, um, if you subtract. Um, Yeah, row 1 plus row 2 minus row 3. Row 1 plus row 2 minus and then minus row 3. That's to create a 0 here, right? I'll probably start to focus on this pivot here. Divided by minus 3 would give me some fractions, so I kind of want to avoid that. Um, what can I do? Row 2 times negative 1 plus row 1. And what if row 1 plus row 3, um, 2 r 2 minus r 3 minus 2 r 2 minus row 3? Wait, what if row 1 plus row 2? I want to create a 0. That's the, that's the best thing to do. How do I get a 0 there? Row 1 plus row 2 uh, divided by 2. Minus yeah. R1 plus R2 minus R3 to get for the third one. Yes, but what would that give you, though? It will give you 0 for negative 5 for the third one. But it will also give you a 1 here. Yeah. Mm. So you're going backwards. Row 2 times so 5 plus row 3 times 3. For, for both sides and this one. If I want to kill that 5, I have to do it somehow using row 2 and row 1 so that I maintain so the zeros here. If I involve row 1, I'm going to get back a non-zero number in the first column. So row 2 times 5 plus row 3 times 3. What if we subtract row 2 from row 3 and then divide it? Uh, to factor it down. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have that. So, yes. Can we multiply negative 3 by negative 5 and then... Yeah, how about we multiply this guy by like negative 5 or something. So say row 2 times negative 5. What would, what would that become? 0, this would be? This would be? This would be? Negative 10, this would be? Negative 5, this would be 0. And I take row 3 and I multiply by 3. So this will be 0, this will be minus 15, this will be 39, this will be 9, this will be 0, this will be 3. And now we can add those two. So it's 1 minus 2, 3, 1, 0, 0. So this is 1. I'm going to put that.
that back because I'm going to change the third row. Now I, I want to change the third row by just adding row two and row three from the previous one. So this plus this is zero, this plus that is zero. This plus that is four. This plus that is minus one. This plus that is minus five. This plus that is three. So I've created the zero there. So this is fine because if eventually I'm going to just divide this row through by four, but let's actually just move up to row two, try to now create that zero. How can I do that? How can I create a zero here? I kind of do the same strategy that I did here. So I can take something like uh, row one times three, and take row two times minus two. Leave the third row alone. So if I take row one times three, I would end up with three minus six, nine, three, zero, zero. Take this times minus two, kill these two. Let's keep going over here. You can probably put another line down here. So how would you kill those two? <clears throat> Row three times seven. Row two. So if I multiply this by minus 4, I'll get 12. Multiply this by minus 4, I get minus 28. Multiply this by minus 4, I get minus 8. I'll multiply this by minus 4, I get minus 4. And zero. That's 0, 0. Multiply this by 7, I get 28. Minus 7, minus 35, minus 24. And I'm going to add now I'm going to add row two and row three here. Zero plus zero, twelve plus zero, this plus this is zero, this plus this is minus fifteen, this plus this is minus thirty-nine. This plus this, minus 21, that's 0, 0, 4, minus 1, minus 5, minus uh, plus 3. And this one I can bring back to 3, 0, minus 5, minus 1, minus 2. Zero. One more guy to kill, this guy. Row three by minus five and row 
one pi over negative one. Multiply row three by minus five. Multiply row one by four. Yeah. So that would give me 12, zero, minus 20, minus four, minus eight, zero. The second row I leave alone. The third row I multiply by minus five, so that's zero, zero. Oh, I just multiply this by five. That'll be 20. Minus 5, minus 25, and 50. So now what I would do, I would take row 1 plus row 3. This plus this is 12, this plus this is 0, this plus this is 0, this plus that is minus 9, this plus that. Uh, minus eight, uh, minus twenty-five. Minus thirty-three. It's minus thirty-three. Zero minus fifteen. Well, zero plus fifteen. And this here is row one plus row three. So zero, twelve, zero, minus fifteen, minus thirty-nine, minus two, zero, zero, twenty, minus five, minus twenty-five. Now we can divide the first and second rows by 12. And now I'm going to take row 1 divided by 12, I'm going to take row 2 divided by 12, and I'm going to take row 3 divided by 20. So divide this by 12, I get 1, 0, 0. Um, 9 over 12 is what? 3 over 4. Um, 33 over 12? 11 over 4. Minus 11 over 4. And 15 <coughs> over 12. 5 over 4. 0, 1, 0. 15 over 12 is minus 5 over 4. 39 over 12 is 13 over 4. Um, 2 over 12 is 1 over 6. Divide this by 20, 0, 0, 1. And that'd be 20. 21, huh? 2. What? The second row on the matrix above is minus 21, not minus 2. Oh, this is minus 21? Yeah. Okay, so 21 divided by 12? 7 over 4. That's minus 7 over 4. So this is 1. This I'm divided by 20, so that becomes minus 1 over 4. Divide this by 20. <coughs> so you can take 5 and teach. You get 5 over 4. Divide this by 20. You get what? 3 over 4. So that's your 8 inverse. <coughs> So that one was annoying. The quiz one I think is easier. Put some zeros in there. Um, so A inverse was, hopefully we did that right. Can check that. 1 over 4. 5 over 4. This thing we're dividing by, you'll see it's related to the determinant when I show you the other way. Minus 7 over 4. Minus 1 over 4, minus 5 over 4, and 3 over 4. I didn't write down the answer. Check. the two.
is using something that we call the adjoint. Yes. So would it be like the adjoint matrix multiplied by uh, one over the determinant? It's one of the term times the adjoint. Yeah. Um, so let's actually define the adjoint. So given A equals A11, A12, A1n, A21, A22, A2n, dot, 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 AN1, AN2, all the way down to ANN. That's an N by N matrix. Define A sub C. I'm going to call this here its matrix of cofactors. Which basically you go through this matrix and you replace each element with the cofactor. Right? I remember that what the cofactor was, was the determinant of the guy you get when you eliminate that row and that column. So this means you're replacing with C11, C12, C1n, C21, C22, C2n, Cn1, Cn2. C and N. You replace each entry with its cofactor. That's called the matrix of cofactors. You can define the adjoint. Let A n by n be a matrix, that's a square matrix. The adjoint of A, which we denote A d j of A, is AC transpose. You take the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. Time I can prove it for you if you're interested, but I'll just tell you what the formula is at this point. Um, A inverse is going to be 1 over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. The proof outline. Um, you actually computed, show that A, <coughs> show that A times the adjoint of A, you actually get the determinant of A times the identity. Um, at that point, you'll use the fact that if you take a row times a cofactor of another row, you'll all get zeros, and so you... You can use that fact to prove this, which I can kind of explain to you why that fact is true next time as well. And so, knowing that A is invertible, you can divide by the determinant and you can multiply both sides by A inverse. So what you can do at this point is you can multiply both sides by A inverse and then divide both sides by the determinant of A. Because there's a theorem that tells us if A is invertible, you can divide by the determinant of A and then you obtain that equation.
I might talk a little bit more about the proof next time, but uh, you don't really have to know it. But you don't really have to know that formula either. Technically, usually if I ask you to find an inverse, I don't care what method you use, but these are the two main methods, so you can actually do this formula. So let's do an example. Let's do it on that one, two, three, four, show that we got the same answer. So first let's find a C. So we're going to put, replace one with its cofactor. Right? Remember that there's a checkerboard of signs that will apply here. Now, if you look at the number one, you block out everyone in his row and his column, you just get the number four. So it becomes a plus four. Look at the number two, block out everyone in that row and that column, you get the number three, becomes a minus three. Replace the number three, block out everyone in that row and that column, you get the number two. Look at the number four, block out everyone in that row and that column, you get the number one. This means that the adjoint of A is equal to the transpose of this. So that means you switch the row in the column. So this is 4 minus 3 minus 2, 1. So you can notice this is the shortcut. This is where the formula comes from, where they said you just swap these two guys and then change the sign of those two guys. It was derived by this formula. And so A inverse is going to be 1 over the determinant of A of this matrix. 4 minus 2 minus 3, 1. The determinant of A is going to be 4 minus 6. Right? This times this minus that times that. And so that's minus a half times 4 minus 2 minus 3, 1. Or in other words, you can multiply the half in. This would give us minus 2 plus 1, 3 over 2 minus a half, which should have been the answer we got last time. All right, this also implies a formula. I, I don't actually know if I wrote this down, so I'll do it now. If you have A, B, C, D, it turns out the determinant of that, a 2 by 2, is always going to be 1 over the determinant of A. Or 1 over AD minus BC times, you're going to um, switch these two and change the sign of those two. And that's a ge general formula you can always use. Inverse. So this is inverse of a 2 by 2. <coughs> Has a nice formula that you can really say like a buzzword. You just like hmm? just for 2 by 2. Or can you use really? This method you can use on any one, but this can't work on a 3 by 3. All right. So, but for two by twos, it turns out to be a shortcut. You can just swap the two guys on the main diagonal and change the sign on the other two, and divide by the determinant. In general, it's not so nice. Like for a three by three, you'll do it differently. So, if we looked at the other guy, what was the three by three we looked at? One, negative two, three. Two, negative one, negative one. Negative three, one, four. So you could do that as well. So you look at the matrix of cofactors. Notice that this will take a plus sign, a minus sign, 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 a plus sign. 
So you block out every. So one, you're gonna replace block out everything in that row in that column. You get minus four plus one. So that'll give you what a minus three. The minus two, you block out everything in that row in that column. You get eight minus three. So that's a five. The three, you block out everything in that row in that column. Find the determinant, you get a two minus a three, that's a minus one. The two, you block out everything in that row in that column, you get minus eight minus three, that's minus 11. Or the minus one, you block out everything in that row in that column, you get four plus nine, that's 13. And for the minus one, block out everything in that row in that column, you get one minus six. Plus six. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that's minus five. Minus three, you block out everyone in that row in that column. You get two plus three. So that's five. For the one, you block out everyone in that row in that column. You get minus one minus six. So that's minus seven. Finally, for the four, block out everyone in that row in that column. Minus one plus four. Yeah. So it's minus three. Plus three. And so if you compute the adjoint of A, I'm just going to take the transpose of this guy. So that's going to be a minus three, minus five, minus one. Positive 11, positive 13, positive 5, 5, 7, 3. And then I will take 1 over the determinant. By the way, this, I think we found a determinant of this in a previous lecture. I think I, I copied the same matrix down. So, to make computation easier. Yes, the determinant was 4. So here, the determinant of A is 4. This is from a previous lecture. Okay. So A inverse now. So this means A inverse is 1 over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. <coughs> That's 1 over 4 times minus 3, 11, 5, minus 5, 13, 7, minus 1, 5, 3. Was this what we got last time or something else? It's what we got last time. So we did the last one right. The likelihood of both of these being the same answer and their one is wrong is not very high. Yeah, we got it. Sign. We're all. We got a sign wrong. I mean, not in this one, but on the previous one when we did it. I think we got a sign wrong. It's yeah. minus five over four on the last row. Here. Yes, and it's also minus seven over four on the second row. Okay, so we made a sign error in one of the two. <laughs> Go, go over and check, because we're, we're pretty much over time now. But you should get the same answer. It's two different methods to get you the same thing. Uh, yes? On the exam, so say like we make a small calculation error like that, the whole thing is wrong completely? Uh, no, but it would depend. Usually you're using the inverse to do something else, so if you made a mistake, you'll notice later in the problem and you can go back and check. Which is which is why you should be listing what you're doing all the time. It's kind of why you want to go and list everything. So it's easy to check over your work. Anyway, we'll stop there. And remember the first test is March 27th. And I'll see you guys.